before you say anything, I know that this isn't the most original video that I could have made. Although, wait a second. I just looked it up, and this is the only video essay I could find on nonviolent storytelling. Huh, I guess this video does have a reason to exist. Well then, put the swords and spears away and let's get plotting. So, conflict. It's defined as a situation in which people, groups, or countries disagree strongly or are involved in a serious argument or an active disagreement between people with opposing opinions or principles. But in writing, this can be expanded to anything that opposes or adds struggle to a goal. This is why we see things like character versus nature, superhuman, technology, and self. In short, conflict is when something becomes a problem. But this problem doesn't always need to be vanquished or punched for it to be resolved, which is something that the new live-action avatar apparently does not understand. Now, what am I constituting as violence? For the sake of this video, violence is just going to mean any form of combat that does physical damage. So, how do you write this nonviolent conflict, and what other stories have done this well or poorly? Quick spoiler warning for earlier episodes of The Disastrous Life of Psyche K, Full Metal Alchemist, Avatar The Last Airbender, and the last episode of Season 1 of Arcane, as well as one or two episodes of the show Everybody Loves Raymond. And all of these shows make perfect sense together and don't have any tonal whiplash at all. Alright, have you watched all of those? Perfect. You have definitely seen nonviolent conflict in films and other forms of media at some point. At the center of any conflict is an internal struggle, and if there isn't this internal struggle, throwing punches isn't going to make your story more interesting. You could have a scene where guy 1 stabs guy 2, but without any context or motive, it's just a guy getting stabbed. However, we can add some internal conflict by way of Guy-1 having sworn off of killing after his grandma's nephew's cousin's friend was killed by Guy-2, and the friend told Guy-1 that murder is bad, actually. So the vengeance quest against Guy-2 has more weight. The internal conflict to avenge the cousin's friend while also honoring their wishes creates a struggle that will ultimately be overcome or failed depending on Guy-1's actions, and he fails half of his resolve when he ends up stabbing Guy-2. But you could have just as or more interesting of an ending if he doesn't stab Guy 2, and instead finds a way to apprehend him and send him to prison without killing. But maybe Guy 2 is sentenced to death, so Guy 1 has to live with the knowledge that his actions did ultimately lead to someone's death. See? Conflict. That very long-winded ramble is all to say, conflict has so much nuance, and it's a shame that a lot of blockbuster movies and adaptations seem to only remember the stabby moments of the original or older works and then only draw from that. I'm definitely not saying that violence can't be good in a story. Most of my favorite stories do have quite a bit of violence in them, even if they're not gory or graphic. But what I am saying is that the conflict doesn't come from the weapons, and we're here to discuss the alternative ways that conflict can be explored so that the audience doesn't get desensitized to fight scenes before you can even get halfway through your story. To that end, Part 1. Conflict in a Nonviolent Story the first and most obvious place you would have nonviolent conflict is in a story that isn't inherently violent, like many sitcoms. And one that illustrates this quite well is Everybody Loves Raymond. The show revolves around the Barones and their strained family relationship. I won't bore you with talking too long about a show from the 90s, but every time I watch the show, I see more and more how it writes its conflict, which seems to follow the Kisha Tenketsu story structure introduction, development, twist, and resolution. Each episode presents a small situation, like when the family is going to a wedding but Ray finds out that a girl he dated in high school was also going to be there. It sets up the conflict, that being that Ray didn't walk her to the door after a school dance and he still feels guilty about it. The show then develops this with Ray's wife forcing him to confront the woman about this and then the conflict really begins once Ray and his wife Deborah get back to the table. The conflict is purely in dialogue. Ray keeps obsessing over his mistake from 20 years ago, Deborah gets mad at him for not feeling the same guilt over the insensitive things that he's done to her over the years, Ray's parents and brother get involved, and the episode reaches its twist, or climax, when Ray's mom Marie has to admit that she actually asked the girl to go out with Ray in the first place, meaning that, as Ray put it, You weren't the pathetic loser! I was the pathetic loser! Which changes the context of the conflict, therefore resolving the episode's conflict. Nonviolent shows like this need to carry a lot in their dialogue and mostly pacifistic actions. There are always at least two wants conflicting with each other. Raymond wants to be free from the guilt of not walking Elizabeth to the door, and Deborah wants Ray to stop obsessing over it because of how it makes him seem like he doesn't care about her. In something a bit more chaotic like Psyche K, most, if not all, of the episodes revolve around Psyche wanting to blend in and keep his powers secret in this world of idiots. For instance, in one episode, a girl wants Psyche to fall for her, but Psyche keeps thwarting her attempts at recreating any anime romance trope. A true Arrow-Ace icon. The conflict of the entire show solely revolves around Psyche needing to get out of any and all social occasions without becoming so unpopular that he gets noticed even more. So, in essence, nonviolent stories require pushback against the protagonist's main wants and need until the resolution is met. Part 2. Stories that do have violence. 
I was just going to title it Violent Stories, but not every story that has violence necessarily is violent. For example, Full Metal Alchemist. Yeah, this anime is about genocide, a lot of murderous people, and a ton of fighting and imperialization, but not every episode is centered around fight scenes. In fact, a lot of what makes each episode intriguing is the world building, thematic conflicts, and the characterization that happens before the fighting. I know this episode has been praised to death for creating one of the most hated characters in anime, alongside using the world building to really show how fucked up alchemy can get, and just generally psychologically destroying its audience. But an alchemist's anguish is really one of the best of the earlier episodes. If you haven't watched it, skip to this time to bypass the spoilers. The setup and initial conflict of this episode ties in with Ed and Al's goal of restoring their original bodies that they lost because they tried using alchemy to revive their mom. And in this episode, they're hoping that the sewing life alchemist Shao Tucker might have a way to help them achieve this goal, which is the main thing that they're concerned with before lust and envy become a problem later in the show. For the development, we meet Shao Tucker's daughter Nina and her dog Alexander, and learn a bit more about the alchemy that he's been up to. Here, we're given the information that he transmuted a chimera that could talk, and it's implied that this has never been publicly achieved, and I'm sure that nothing Nothing tragic will come of this information and set up, right? Right? Well, skipping ahead, Shao Tucker creates a second talking chimera that totally irrelevantly looks like a dog with long hair the same color as his daughter's. I do admit this is where the episode gets violent, but the violence is only a consequence of firstly the conflict of HOW COULD YOU LIVE WITH YOURSELF, YOU MOTHER and secondly, the underlying internal conflict of why the Elworth brothers were here in the first place, finding a way to restore their bodies that they lost while trying to alchemy their mom back to life, which is unsettlingly close to what Tucker did. The part where Edward does what we all want to do and beats up Tucker within an inch of his life is only really a fraction of the scene and serves as the apex of the episode's climax. Here, we can see that the conflict is built and sustained by asking questions about the theme and world building, and providing possible answers to those questions followed by each character's responses to them. In Backs in the Distance, again skip to this time to avoid spoilers, the climax involves a major internal conflict clashing with an external one, that being whether Winry will shoot Scar for killing her parents during the Ishvalan War. Despite the setup, the scene doesn't actually end in violence, but rather one of my favorite episode endings in the entire series, where Ed gets Winry to put down the gun, telling her that she's the only reason he's survived. She isn't a fighter, and it's her ability to help people live that makes her strong. So then, what about scenes that feel violent but aren't? This one is definitely a bit of a stretch, considering the murder and ignition to war that happens at the end of the scene, but hear me out. Given the description, paired with the spoiler warning, you probably know the scene I'm talking about. Arcane's Tea Party, the climax of episode 9. Skip to this time to avoid spoilers. Context for anyone who isn't planning on watching Arcane, Powder was supposedly betrayed by her sister Vi as a kid, leading her to become the feral murderer Jinx who's working with her unsettling father figure Silco. Also Vi has a girlfriend, I mean, girl who she's strangely close to and would die for, named Caitlyn. During the climax, Jinx tied up Vi, Caitlyn, and Silco, forcing them all to sit around a table where she set up a little tea party with two chairs, one saying Powder and the other saying Jinx. I explained this in a different video about Points of No Return, and I'm definitely way too late to the tea party with analyzing this scene, but the scene essentially resolves Jinx's internal conflict from the rest of the series. And, looking before the violence, we can see that the conflict arises from what Vi says and will say to Jinx throughout the scene. Vi is given options that tear at her own internal conflicts of wanting Powder back but also caring about Caitlyn, all while not being able to let go of who Jinx once was. This is a huge part of conflict, presenting options where a character can definitively only choose one. Shoot Caitlyn and get Powder back, or choose Caitlyn, which will make Powder never come back. And we can see these conflicting goals and mentalities earlier in the show as well. In the council scenes, there isn't any physical violence, but rather clashing ideologies. Only one can prevail, but convincing the others to change their mind is where the real conflict arises. Part 3, why am I talking about all of this? You see, well, <laughs> funny story. When video games are your main source of input for storytelling, a lot of your stories end up with the protagonist fighting a villain as the climax of a lot of episodes and chapters that you write. I'm not saying that this is the only type of conflict that I write, but it's still a difficult thing to write around. And there are only so many antagonists that you can throw at your main characters before each individual one begins to lose their narrative weight. You can't consistently repeat your villains or else they'll become less threatening with each encounter, but you still have to find something of substance to fill the chapters between the major external conflicts. It's a dilemma, to be sure. Of course, exploring different aspects of the theme is a great way of creating conflict for each chapter or episode, but you still need to provide pushback to that theme or ideology by way of an external conflict that embodies it. So how do you not have a villain fight your protagonist in each episode? Well, have you ever seen Avatar? Not that one. No? Oh, definitely not. Ah, there we go. 
Avatar The Last Airbender definitely has quite a bit of fighting in it, but that isn't all that makes the show good. Like with the other examples, it's the motives behind the fights as well as the storytelling between, during, and after many physical conflicts that makes Avatar so special, and some of the best moments in the show entirely lack combat. In the episode The Storm, from Book 1, most of the conflict arises from Aang's guilt and Zuko's lost honor. Aang's backstory had an entirely non-violent premise unless you're counting the storm itself. It shows a situation, Aang being told too early that he's the Avatar, also leading to the fact that he may be separated from Gyatso, and his reaction of running away. They tie this back into the present day with Aang needing to face his guilt, being supported by Katara, and eventually overcoming a parallel situation where he saves Sokka from a similar storm. The more violent part of this episode is Zuko's backstory, where he speaks out during a war meeting and has to do an Agni Kai, but finds out that the person he's dueling is his father, who I guess is at least probably maybe a bit of a better father than Shao Tucker. This whole sequence of events is already great at building tension with only the threat of violence, and during the climax of this backstory arc, Zuko chooses pacifism even though his father does not. And that act of refusing to fight is so much more powerful than what they did in the most recent adaptation, which really shows how character decisions are what makes conflicts and resolutions interesting. So then, part four, who's the antagonist? If you don't have violent conflict, then what is the character actually struggling against? It seems to usually boil down to beliefs, ideologies, and wants. Situation and reaction, essentially. You could have a character trying to solve a case and the external and internal pushback serve as the conflict. You could have another character who really wants a pocket watch and the conflict is that it isn't being sold in any local stores. Or maybe one person is trying to convince somebody else that Xenoblade 2 is actually the best one in the series. Come on, don't you see how good the storytelling is? <clears throat> anyway. Conflict, despite its violence level, is just a roadblock on the path to a character's goal. Not even the whole overarching goal, but smaller ones as well. And this leads to an interesting point. Why do these characters fight villains in the first place? What's the roadblock that they're posing? Sometimes it really is just as simple as, I need to survive and can't do this while this evil guy is after me. It's the main motive for most horror movies. On the other hand, in superhero movies, the motive is often not about personal survival, but rather the preservation of a city or the world. Unless they're an anti-hero, I guess. But when you have a good guys versus bad guys plot, what's the goal and pushback behind each hero-villain encounter? Usually, this can be pretty simple and arise from several different motives depending on who the protagonist is fighting, mainly why they're fighting. A law enforcement antagonist is likely trying to arrest the main characters for the illegalities of their heroic actions. A stereotypically evil antagonist might need the superpowered hero alive in order to complete their goal. A detective is probably trying to find a way to prove their suspect guilty, which probably isn't going to be done through a fight. But what do the protagonist motives look like apart from kill the bad guys? Well, in direct response to the aforementioned possible antagonist motives, we can have trying not to be arrested, trying to prevent the antagonist from using the hero's power to do some world destroying, and last, trying to preserve their false queen record. Looking at it this way, protagonist motives in these situations seem somewhat basic, don't they? They're only reactions to what the antagonists are doing, right? Well, while this is true in a lot of cases, I feel like there could be a bit more to it. Considering that most stories need a shift in power dynamics that changes throughout the narrative, it makes sense that the protagonist would typically be at some sort of disadvantage for a long part of the story, only really being able to react to what the antagonists are doing until the protagonist's victory at the end, assuming it isn't grimdark or tragedy. And as I say, a hero is only as good as their villain. And I know that we've veered way off track from nonviolent storytelling, but understanding the different facets of conflict are important to truly being able to understand or write any form of conflict. But back to the previous point, how do we make our characters active participants rather than only being able to react to everything around them? And it all comes full circle back to the idea of goals. Why do we have villains? They're hindrances that prevent the antagonists from achieving their goal. The conflict isn't that the heroes and villains are fighting, it's that the villains are keeping the heroes from fulfilling their wants and needs. Does this need to be violent? No. Can it be? Absolutely. Part 5. I forgot the point I was trying to make. Summary. There's a lot of hollow conflict in movies and TV. Sure, the characters are fighting, but no amount of special effects is going to make it mean anything. So, if you're struggling to write conflict in your own stories, consider where your conflict is coming from. Does the fight scene actually hold the protagonist back from their goal, or is it just spectacle? If it's the first one, then go ahead, stab that protagonist. We do not condone actual violence here on Into the Plot. But if it's the second, you might want to reevaluate what the goal and internal conflict actually is. And with that, I think that's it. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm gonna go reread the part where Shao Tucker ends up being the only character in Full Metal Alchemist to go to hell. Hello, and welcome to the end of the video! Thanks all for watching! If you like this type of content, there is the button under the video for that, but no pressure. 
This one was a bit more rambly than I expected, but I kept realizing new aspects of writing conflict as I was typing the script. The video would have been a lot longer if I hadn't restrained myself on talking about Fire Emblem Three Houses support conversations, or else it would have been at least five extra pages. These videos usually come from challenges that I face in my own writing, or just something that I think is interesting in a video game. So if you have any other ideas for video topics you want me to cover, let me know. Well, that's all for now. Happy writing! Bye!